Okay, and here we are in the moment that every YouTuber, uh, everyone who streams on YouTube actually knows that is that moment where are we online or we are not, are we really streaming or we are not? And uh, yes, here we are. Oh God, on YouTube I have... <laughs> Okay, I'm watching my my picture on YouTube. I I'm probably fatter, twenty kilos fatter now. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's try if we can fix this a little bit. No, we can't. We can't. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this live stream. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this live stream. As you can see, I'm not in the usual environment. I'm traveling. So I am using a piece of technology that is a bit makeshift, let's say. And I'm not entirely familiar with, but I thought I could miss this opportunity. And I haven't been streaming uh, for... Uh, quite a long time so i thought it was definitely the case in this live stream we are going to answer a fundamental question a question that i'm sure everyone in the history of mankind has always struggled to understand which is can we really cook spaghetti bolognese at 33,000 feet and beside that we are going to answer all a number of questions a lot of the questions that you asked in the last few days when i actually added a post uh, saying that i was going to uh, live stream and you definitely uh, asked a lot of questions and probably way too many in the sense that uh, there are probably almost 300 questions so i'm afraid i can't answer everyone so what i'm going to do well there are some questions that are basically uh, similar they are pretty much all uh, the same uh, so i sort of bundle as so, so we'll sort of choose one and answer that hoping that i'm going to answer to some other people uh, i have also chosen some other questions that i believe could be interesting for everyone and I accurately avoided all the questions where uh, I basically knew nothing about. So I'm elegantly avoiding to answer some of the questions that I really didn't. Um, that I really didn't. Uh, I really didn't know about. And um, so this is the program for uh, tonight and uh, it's probably going to be a bit longer than usual to be honest so uh, i would say that if you are seeing me correctly if you can hear me correctly and please give me something in chat to confirm this i believe that without further ado we can definitely start watching the list of the questions and start answering some of the questions so do you okay so do you see me do you can you hear me okay night rider thank, thank you says that he can hear me is everything okay good evening to you think sound and vision good Okay, Shurab, uh, thank you very much. You are the first one tonight asking my views on the Tejan, Tejas and the Amka. It will come, please. It will come. Just be patient, guys. You always ask. <laughs> thank you for asking me, to be honest. It will come. Don't worry, it will come at some point. Okay, uh, good. So... Um, so, without further ado, let's start talking. So, one of the questions that was quite common was something about uh, to say something about me. I did in several uh, occasions, to be honest, but 
since recently there have been quite a few uh, new subscribers and a number of people that actually have been so kind to um, let's say help me and uh, decide to follow the channel probably is worth saying again so my uh, i'm not telling you my entire real name but you can call me gas uh i am for the yeah, security reasons but okay i am italian i'm 53 years old my qualification but probably my most important qualification is the fact that i am a lifelong uh I'm passionate, I'm passionate. Uh, been, um, I have a lifelong passion for everything uh, aerospace and uh, for aerospace and uh, uh, in um, anything, anything pretty much military with a focus on the military aspects of what has gone. Uh, then um, I have uh, I had a school uh, my my school career my educational career I uh, studied aeronautical engineering at the Polytechnic Institute of Milan when I studied uh, the system was still the uh, Italian system um, so it was uh, it's what I have is roughly equivalent as uh, to a master in aeronautical engineering uh, uh, with a focus on the aircraft systems and uh, to do my final dissertation uh, which was in, in italy at the time was traditionally about one year 18 months uh, of extra study of extra work i did that by an italian um, aircraft manufacturer and I worked there for uh, for about uh, yeah for about eighteen months, uh, developing my work. Uh, after that, I served in the Italian Air Force still for uh, well the uh, compulsory service was about one year, but I've chosen to stay a bit longer. And uh, my job, I, I wasn't, I wasn't flying. I wasn't a pilot or anything like that. Uh, I was, um, I was a technician. I was basically working on electronics, uh, on the ele electronic system, ground electronic system, uh, or aircraft electronic systems. Um, uh, particularly with communications, I was working in really in communications. To be, to be honest, um, after that. I well started a professional work after a short stint in the uh, company that today is called Accenture. I went for the Milan. I worked for quite a few years for Milan Airport Authority, and after that, I moved away. Totally changed my career, and I totally changed tact and I went into IT. And as an IT consultant, some of my customers have been aeronautical or, let's say, defense uh, uh, companies in uh, basically uh, basically in Italy. So um, now I'm still working in IT because I mean YouTube for me is a side gig. Um, maybe one day it will be a full time thing, but. For now, is not possible, and the um, uh, am I still working in IT? And uh, I've waited so long before starting doing this for yeah for a number of reasons, including the fact that I wanted to be well detached by all the customers, all the people that I've known in the industry, and so on. They're not many; I don't have an enormous experience. Uh, but um, yeah, I think I have, I know enough to understand why some choices are made either from the technical aspect or the operational aspect. Um, yeah, professional, professionals know better, but professional, professionals also have their mouth, they keep their mouth, their mouth shut shut because all the stuff that we are discussing is uh, obviously security implication and every piece of, uh, no longer uh, if i ever had 
uh, which may may have, I may have or may not have had uh, access to <laughs> classified information. Um, everything that I know is very old and probably not relevant today. And so today I'm 100% independent. I have zero stake in anything, anyone, or anything else. And all the information that you get uh, from the channel is open source. Okay, Part is confirmed news, part is uncertain news, and I try to mention all of them <laughs> to clearly state which is which. Part is just my opinion, which I don't know if you're any or that you're good enough to consider interesting and follow me. So I hope this is uh, um, I hope this is this is uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, so when so there is another interesting question that says when did your vacuum robot become sentient? Uh, that was actually an accident that happened some time ago. There will be a story about the genesis of Otis. Just be patient. Okay, so I hope there were several questions around uh, in this area. So I hope I have answered to, to them. So who we have? Carl Davis. Uh, and uh, one of our usual, uh, one of our usual, thank you, one of our usual, uh, uh, one of our usual listeners. So thank you. Okay. So, Sakin Sharma, stop. Okay, please stop. Uh, the second thing, the second, uh, this gives me the um, the opportunity to speak about another problem. I am uh, um, I am uh, uh, I tend not to I tend not to uh, answer directly uh, directly to questions like uh, India versus China or United States versus China kind of things what or what is the best what is the strongest what is it? it's not the kind uh, um, it's not the kind of things that I normally do because they always require articulated answers so um, it's not the stuff that is for, for live stream uh, it's the stuff for entire videos or even more than one video for more than one video so that is the that is the point uh then i have another and about this i also have another question that says from legend of summer which is the first one that we do today that says why are you so biased in favor of india against pakistan pakistan air force has some of the richest history in aviation and you don't give them a mention well part of, part that i had at least one video about that entirely dedicated to that um, so I can just give you the usual answer every time someone actually uh, tells me that I'm biased or I have a stake. Uh, the sense that I have been accused of being pro-Russian, pro-Chinese, uh, pro-American in few cases, uh, pro-European in general, pro uh, uh, pro-British, pro-French, uh, pro-Indian, and pro-Pakistan. So. Um, basically I've been accused of being pro everything curiously nobody ever told me that I'm pro Italian which is probably the only thing I'm really pro I love my uh, uh, second country uh, the United Kingdom I'm grateful to, to that country but I'm still Italian I'm, I'm basically an Italian that lives in the United Kingdom who lives in the United Kingdom so I I'm uh, I'm, but so basically, the only one that I'm really eventually biased a little bit against, uh, a little bit, uh, ah, the only one that the only country that I'm potentially biased a little bit in favor is definitely Italy. Everything for everything else, I don't have a stake. 
on anything i just uh, i'm just interested to learn and i'm sorry if sometimes i have opinions or i reach conclusions that do not conform to your opinions i yeah okay just don't know what to do guys so that's the that's the thing uh, um, okay then before starting speedy left a question which is actually a comment uh, the point that you did is very interesting if you're watching please uh, contact uh, me separately with the email on the about uh, on the email on the about tab on the channel because it's something that i was not aware but if it is the if it is like you say it is really interesting we may have a discussion or a video around that uh, so please contact me and the same is true for the user rate ratian uh, just contact me tell me what you did uh, if it is interesting i'm definitely happy to feature it on the on the channel or consider discussing your position okay now this was quite a long build up but let's go into the actual questions so always sunny is saying i've noticed that most u.s fighter designs are that are proposed to be used by both the air force and navy including both conceptual uh, and actual require the wing to be redesigned not just to be folded on the carrier deck but also to be larger to have better low speed control meanwhile the sukhoi 33 and the rafal m appear to use a common wing design how were they able to avoid this is it the canards uh, nope uh, so uh, the rafal um, is true is um, is exactly the wing is exactly the same uh, but the suit 33 i believe there are some small differences it's larger than a suit 27 for example slightly larger than a suit 27 and um, it's definitely not the knards and the says in the sense that there is a uh, the air force had definitely a different uh, 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 if you, if, uh, for example, if you took the F-35, um, we, the um, Air Force still had, definitely had a different requisite than the Navy. The Navy has this very strong limitation uh, that is the necessity of landing on a deck, which means uh, low uh, approaching speed and also low uh, uh, low takeoff speed and uh, in uh, this case uh, while well, the the air force doesn't and there are flip side there are obviously pros and cons smaller wings uh, behave better at high speed larger wings behave worse at high speed so you may expect that the for example, the F-35A is going to be speed-wise and acceleration-wise a bit better than the F-35C. While the F-35C is probably a bit better in terms of maneuverability. That was the reason why the variable, um, the variable, uh, the, 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 the variable sweep wing made sense for uh, naval operations. That you could have the best of both worlds paying that with some weight uh, increase and uh, with the also with the uh, with the maintenance and the, and the cost that was higher so hope this is explains uh, the problem mig bait what are the risks of collateral eye damage when airborne lasers engage a target and much of that energy is reflected? Especially considering the presumed move to pulse laser with femtosecond intensity orders of magnitude greater than continuous wave laser. Will we be randomly blinding people who happen to be looking in the wrong direction at the wrong time? So this is probably a question that should... Um, be asked to an ophthalmologist to be honest uh, uh, explaining the 
what's going, what happens, and then just telling them which are the energies involved. Um, as far as I know, yes, it is a real, it is a real risk. It's not that common because the reflection is hardly specular reflection, so you need to be looking exactly into the laser to have serious damages um, uh, to the eye. But the yeah, I believe that the the, the problems the, the problem is there. Tony is asking: Can a fighter plane go? A super maneuverability while flying supersonic, for example, 1.2 to 1.4 Mach. Yes, it's possible. Um, it's not often done uh, because at that speed, uh, the uh, guys, if you ask me, so um, just one thing, um, I'm uh, just for the house rules, I am answering the, the questions that have been put into the form as I've asked into this explaining every video and I asked into the post a few days ago. If you're asking me questions on the chat, uh, I'm basically not even looking at them, it's I can hardly see them uh, because they go very fast. When we are done, uh, if I still have some voice. Uh, I will be happy to answer some of the chat questions, um, particularly if someone wants to add a super chat, or will, I will try to answer as the best as I can. But for now, while I'm going through these questions, um, please don't ask, because uh, it is extremely likely that I'm not going to, uh, to, to even see them, okay? Just don't want to turn out to, to be unpolite, but that's the, that's the thing. So, can a fighter plane go super maneuverable uh, at supersonic speed? Yes, it can, uh, but it, in principle, it's hardly done because um, doing that kind of maneuver at a very high speed can cause something which is called either uh, um, some phenomena which are called uh, high speed stalls or high speed the or in general high speed divergence and high speed stall is a situation in which the flow detaches from the wing because you're flying in a strange uh, with a strange attitude um but the overall speed is well above the um the speed of the aircraft okay some very very good pilots in even in the jet era used to do that used use this kind of high speed stall and high speed div divergence as a combat maneuver to quickly point the nose of the aircraft Today, I don't think it's still used. Um, probably uh, flight controls won't let you do that. Tony again. Can a fighter plane have a thrust to weight ratio of 2 to 1? Extremely unlikely. With the average weights that you have uh, uh, today and uh, the the empty waste that you have today and the and the trust that you have with the engines probably a very uh, uh, probably a, a stripped down version that is designed just to have an outstanding excess of energy during maneuver could uh, maybe get to that point but if it if the aircraft needs to be in any configuration that is even remotely useful for combat, no, it's it's way too much. It's way too much. Uh, Peter Traxas, keeping in mind a the big cost difference between Rafale and grip and b the excellent grip of performance at any drill air combat where Rafale is so preferable from for many countries. Uh, why is it? Why you say it's so preferable? I mean, there are mm, the Rafale has been built in larger numbers than the Gripen so far, but not that many. But not uh, and yeah, there are a number in terms of number of countries with 
we we are still talking about a handful of countries. Uh, the um, uh, the the difference with the, the with the Gripen, you're also marrying a specific philosophy, uh, philosophy, which is the one which is the Swedish philosophy, something which is simple, that can be operated very easily. The cost that doesn't cost a lot. It has the best equipment that that uh, money that uh, that can be installed or one of the best electronic equipment or armament that can be installed on an aircraft, but the aircraft itself is, uh, in terms of pure performance, is not incredible. Uh, the Rafale, on the contrary, in terms of performance, is uh, better. Uh, but is also you are also making a sort of a choice in the sense that you're using French weapons with Rafale, and some countries are comfortable to do that. Some co some countries, for example, like India, can pay for the integration of other weapons. Um, so that's uh, that, that's a combination of uh, that, that choosing one or the other is actually a combination of of reasons. There's no as as usual. There is always a weight. Is always is always the uh, weighted decision uh, the way you weight different parameters and different capabilities. No. Jami Alal. According to some sources, the Chengdu J20 can reach Mach 2.7 in some conditions. The YF-23, although all domain information is still classified for this aircraft, can too reach high Mach number. How important is high top speed in modern combat? So, provided that I don't believe that the J20 can get 2.7 Mach, this could be in the best condition is probably around Mach 2, 1.8, something like this, but I don't I don't think it's it is that fast. At least not now, probably. Maybe with different engines it will be a bit faster, but not that fast. Um the YF23, uh, guys stop speaking about the YF23. It was today it would be probably um, it would be probably an, an, an obsolete aircraft in maybe the aerodynamic formula since there were few um, a few improvements in the last few decades in terms of aerodynamics maybe the aerodynamic formula is still valid the, um, the aircraft itself would be built in a totally different way today. So, no? so the UAF-23 is definitely out of any equation. It is an interesting historical aircraft, but it's not to, today is, has no resemblance. But I think that the key point of the question is how important is high top speed in modern combat. So top speed is usually not really important because the top speed that you get is normally in uh, is normally the top speed that you get is normally the speed where with the aircraft in a very clean configuration with not a lot of fuel uh, so it's not a practical configuration however speed is important because speed adds energy to the weapons. The faster you go, the higher is the energy of your weapon when you release them. And when you are looking for range, that is, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's an important feature. And uh, those who follow me regularly know that going for range is not that easy, but is um, if what you're looking after is definitely energy and range, uh, speed is important and is also important because uh, if the weapon that you release is not uh, doesn't need to uh, uh, to go through the sound barrier, is going to use uh, its speed much more. I mean, its energy, its own energy, much much more efficiently. So speed is important. The top speed, it's just 
it's just a it's just a proxy number in itself is not really important always uh, second question from Jamie ll uh, another question Chengdu, Chengdu j20 uh, in one of your previous videos you said the j20 is made of most aluminum and only a small portion of composite is there any reason why China have its fifth generation fighter so conventional in terms of materials uh, well uh, it's always difficult to understand uh, this kind of uh, choices definitely the Chinese can use composite composite materials uh, they, they, they are to a level to a level that is probably not that much inferior or not inferior to anyone else it's not an in terribly complicated technology now or at least not today at least you're trying to get to, to acquire it today in the sense that but it's, a lot, it's one of those technologies that you really can't keep secret in the sense there are a lot of books that describe how to, to, to assemble and to make composites so it's not it's not that much uh, it, it's not that much uh, it's not that much difficult I believe they just made a choice in for practicality I believe there is uh, some industrial considerations behind that so they, they believe that this, in this way the production was more efficient I think so don't know for sure but the uh, is not always uh, the, the this kind of choices are not always uh, uh, due to the performance or the look for the performance uh, or the, when they're looking for performance or the search the quest for the performance they may just be industrial consideration it was just simpler to make it like this Krakasaurus rocks. That's uh, congratulation, great nickname. What are the effects of placing engine air intakes on the upper side of the fuselage as opposed to below? Is this feasible for an air dominance focus platform? So the pro the problem with that is that the it's relatively intuitive and at high at high angles of attack if you a dorsal air intake is going to have uh, to sit in probably a detached flow or uh, in an irregular floor or within vortices uh, so the aerodynamic field at the uh, entrance of the intake is going to be definitely not ideal and the same but the same is not true for the ventral position this is the reason why you see you see really so few aircraft that have dorsal air intakes it's more common with drones but they're not supposed to do any particular maneuvers and the uh, for an air dominance platform uh, uh, well, if you if you if you are thinking that an air dominance platform is a platform that is always going to sling missiles from one hundred miles away, well, that must be yeah, probably is not going to make a lot of difference. But I don't know. I wouldn't use it really for a, for a, for a fighter that really needs to maneuver. That's not the, that's not the case. Arlus is asking, what is the difference between agility and maneuverability of an aircraft? If an aircraft is said to be highly agile, that does it imply it will be highly maneuverable too, and vice versa? Um, it's never put in this way. So it is um, these are these two terms are sort of umbrella terms colloquial terms that try to give a general assessment of how an aircraft is actually capable of maneuvering from an engineering perspective you use other more uh, let's say more objective measures like the roll rates or the pitch rates, or in general the aerodynamic uh, derivatives. So uh, 
uh, these two terms are really colloquial terms. And I, personally, I would use them in, interchangeably. I never think, I never thought it was a real thing. Uh, it's just a, it's just a, yeah, it's just a colloquial term. Exceptor. Air defense by employing drone air platforms with air-to-air -air missiles that linger in specific petrol area areas. Is it possibly an alternative to ground uh, anti-air artillery? Uh, so the concept is definitely interesting. Uh, in the sense that what is being studied now, concepts like loyal wingman or the Skyborg concepts or, or the Okotnik project in Russia, for example, and the plethora of Chinese stuff that I always forget the, the exact names is, uh, all of that is um, based on the, on the concept that the unmanned platform will have missiles to do the job. They, we are thinking that they're going to be controlled, controlled by aircraft and not from the ground. But uh, I see in principle no problem in doing both. For example, the Okotnik is, um, the Okotnik, the Russian one, is can be controlled from the ground or can be controlled from the aircraft. Uh, so it is uh, uh, it is designed to, to, to do both, actually. The problem with having an unmanned platform in air-to-air -air combat is the basically the situational awareness. In the sense that, uh, the, what I mean, the sensors on the aircraft are local and can define and uh, can quickly can in principle spot and identify all the ma menaces in the in the nearby environment and uh, so they can the, the the pilot can operate the uh, the drones uh, in in a way which is consistent with the situation at the moment uh, an operator from the ground that is actually relying uh, that maybe sitting a hundred kilometers away and is relying uh, to the informations from uh, an OVAX aircraft for example or some ground uh, based radars uh, has a way lower situational awareness of what is going on exactly in uh, in that position maybe may it may have some he or she may have a sort of god's eye view of what is going on but the materially the, the, the precision of the information is going to be lower so it's definitely doable um, probably not optimal uh, well, well, you may say, well, why don't you place the sensors on the drone? Yes, but if you place too many sensors on the drone, the drone stops being cheap. And if it is not cheap, uh, it becomes, uh, or, or simple in a sense, if it is not cheap and simple, is it, it cannot be mass produced. If it can be mass produced, it's not going to be a treatable. And so it's going to, so if you can't afford to lose one, is not really much better than, than a piloted vehicle. So yes, it is an interesting concept, uh, still see some problems. Always exceptor. Does computer control guns exist on fighter planes? Example, when the enemy plane reaches appropriate range and angle, and angle the machine gun shoots automatically, self-calculating optimal burst and angle to preserve ammo and ensure a hit. Um, yes, there have been many, <laughs> many attempts to do that. The last one that I know was the Rafa was on the Rafale. It was planned to have an automatic cannon, uh, but then they sort of gave up in the sense they said it was 
probably not worth the was not worth the 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 the, the 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 cost and the complexity were was not worth the additional uh, the additional capability that was providing. Always acceptor air fighter planes equally success uh, susceptible to bird strike as commercial planes. Definitely yes. Um, they they have marginally better protection, but yes, they are susceptible. Henrik, will the F-36, uh, no, yes, actually Henrik is asking a number of questions, many people actually ask more questions in one go, and Henri Henrik is asking a number of questions, will the F-36 Kingsnake be a uh, United States Air Force next fighter? Definitely not, the F-36 Kingsnake was a press speculation, it wasn't an official project, it was the blog hash kit that came up with a, an hypothesis, um, an hypothesis to of uh, uh, how this new four plus plus five minus generation aircraft for the for the air force uh, could be, but no, probably won't, will be something completely different. I really would love if the United States Air Force would buy the checkmate, the Russian checkmate, but I'm sure it won't, it won't happen. Anyway. Uh, uh, is there any chance that Japan will bring back the moderni a modernized version of the YF-23? I don't believe so. As I said, it is not the... Just, guys, just forget the YF-23. is historically very interesting, but... Uh, today will be obsolete. Maybe someone will build something that looks a bit like that, but will be different aircraft. Sixth generation fighters will have the ability to control swarm drones. This will increase the pressure on the pilot. Could this end up uh, a return of the weapon system officers? You bet so. In the sense that both well, the 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 air uh, the air force, the United States Air Force has uh, decided to uh, go with one pilot because the F thirty five is highly automated, and uh, that's their decision. But the rest of the world is going in a different direction. The Gripen. Uh, the the two the, the two seater versions of the Gripen are in the in service with the Swedish Air Force are actually used in a different way since the Gripen is a networked aircraft, not too much, not very dissimilar from the F thirty five, from this point point of view sensor fusion, they are using the um, two seaters as common posts for the air battle. Since they don't have a, uh, since they have a wax, but they tend to use these aircraft for common posts, and it will make sense. Um, it will definitely make sense to have one. The French, something which is not very known, the, the French with the Rafale, which is another aircraft, which is a which is a network aircraft that features sensor fusion. Before the F thirty five was even ready and had a number of firsts, to be honest, Rafale had a number of firsts, but they're not public, they're not very, <laughs> but they didn't give a lot of, of publicity to that. But one of the situations that they had, they were planning to have about three quarters of the Rafale's uh, single-seaters and about one quarter double-seaters. The Two seaters were supposed to be attack aircraft. Then they started doing, uh, then they and some enter service, and they started doing uh, uh, doing tests and doing training, and they realized that the two seaters performed so much better than the single seaters that they pretty much reversed the percentage. Now about two thirds of the Rafale are two seaters 
and about a third are single seaters. And uh, the, the logic is exactly the same. Um, you have two brains rather than one to, to do something very complicated. And with two brains, you are leaving room for other activities also. So yes, if you have drones, it will bring... Uh, it, it, you, if you have drones, you may we will you will have single seater aircraft controlling drones, but dual seaters to uh, the, uh, will be probably much better. To that, uh, so sorry. Okay, then no, let's keep this. J J J J J J J that that's the way this guy actually said himself. Do you think that non-stealth air uh, air to air fighter will have a future with more and more stealth fighter on uh, uh, sorry, do you think that non-stealth air to air fighters will have a future with more and more stealth fighters on the field? So but we should First, we should start using the rather than stealth. We should start using uh, very low observability, because stealth is really generic. Very low observability. So the point is that what is very low observable today, probably not going to be forever. Okay, so uh, stealth is probably in, in a few years' time, if it's not already today, it is becoming something which is useful and should be there, should be featured by an aircraft, but it would be one of the many uh, features that a modern aircraft should have. So a non-stealth aircraft that is actually capable of tracking stealth aircraft can still have uh, its own validity, okay? despite what the Americans are saying, you know, by the numbers that you hear about the F-35 shooting down 20 aircraft to one. Actually, it seems that there is a video that's also say that that percentage in, in, in a red flag has been 78 to one, which is a bit difficult to be, yes, it's not normal, cannot, cannot be. So that's the so that's the point. Yes, uh, yes. I mean, stealth has been important. It's still important, but it is one of the features that are actually required. Acciaio Temprato, uh, compatriot of mine, how the inertia of the rotor of the uh, the rotor of the engine affect the flight dynamic, roll, pitch, and yaw, and now is it? taken in account by the fly-by-wires, and in case of a dual-engine aircraft, are the rotors of the engine rotating in opposite direction? No. Um, but maybe it would be better to do, uh, to do so uh, to consider in the flight dynamics. So, uh, the F so while propellers have a, um, have a very important gyroscopic effect, uh, even because they are placed quite far from the center of gravity of the aircraft, jet engines is pretty much negligible. And uh, you don't have right engines and left engines because uh, just for sake of simplicity, just, just for sake of simplicity is in the sense. So you need to, you, sh you will have two entirely different sets of parts of one of the parts that is the most difficult to produce and the most expensive to produce. So no, they are all rotating in the same direction and they are, um, but the gyroscopic effect is very, very small. Uh, yeah, because they're basically not that, not that heavy, a bit. We is actually saying, asking, Russia Chinese military aircraft engineer, engineers are working since 20 uh, working close together since 2016 is their concept to smelt its their air force together 
They have joint air patrols and pilots train together regularly. Is the Chinese pilot training similar to Russia's? Uh, so, no. The answer, in short, the answer is definitely no. Uh, so, yes, Russia and China do cooperate quite a lot in these days, but they do cooperate quite a lot because they have uh, an opponent in common, a potential opponent in common, which is the, the United States. Actually, Russia and China are, wouldn't be natural friends in, uh, in, in, in in normal conditions, but in the current political, uh, internationally political environment, they tend to cooperate quite a lot. They are not going to, to fuse anymore. There may be an alliance. Definitely there may be an alliance. Boston Scott, does rain, snow, sleet degrade stealth, or is it equally equally detrimental to radars? Weather must really beat up the surfaces. Uh, yes, it. Yes, it. Uh, uh, yes, it does. Not uh, let's say. Not um, not heavily, but yes, it. Yes, it does. Uh, actually, if you have ice on the wings, uh, you normally stop being concerned about stealth. You, you just start being concerned about staying in the air. Uh, but yes, everything that changes the profile of the wings, um, I mean, and changes the shape of the wings, and even water, uh, is, is having an effect. Uh, as far as I've, from what I've heard, what I've seen, I've read and I've heard, uh, is not that terrible. Uh, but it's true that stealth degrades more than the radars, particularly the longer range radars, uh, and stealth degrade stealth degrades more quickly than the radars. So the radars have an advantage in bad weather. Sparehead. Why turboprop cruise missiles are not built? And okay, this this is a question that made me think. the The, the, the question was why not? The, uh, in fact, I asked for myself why not. So the I don't know for sure to be honest, but I believe that um, because uh, I mean you, you see a lot of drones that are actually propeller have a propeller, so that could be. Could be a turboprop. Why, why not turboprop? The answer that I'm giving myself is still because is because uh, you still want something that has a speed that is higher than the speed that can be guaranteed by a propeller. You still want something which is highly subsonic or even supersonic, and turboprop just won't cut it. Could. I mean, could be a, could be a, I don't know. I mean, you could probably build drones with a turboprop and use them as a cruise missile, as a suicide drones, no? so, as a, some sort of cruise missiles. But I don't, I don't know. It doesn't seem a, a really uh, compelling, uh, compelling case. It doesn't seem to be a really compelling case for that. Potato is asking, we always hear about radar countermeasure, but what about RF equipment? Can aircraft, aircraft, and aircraft weapon data links be jammed effectively? You bet so. Uh, in the sense, one of the uh, features, one of the things that one of the technologies that actually the Russians are probably today have probably today have an edge. Of the United States is exactly in these German technologies. They have seen, they have been seen, uh, uh, they have been seen at work a few times, and they were capable of messing around with the GPS, uh, shutting down the, the at least some of the data links. Obviously, the directional data links that for the of the most recent aircraft are more difficult. To, to interfere with, 
but um, it's definitely something which is possible. Definitely something possible. As far as I know, the French did a lot of studies around or in the West, did a lot of studies around this. But I don't know which kind of level. This is the kind of stuff that you will never know exactly how it is, because that's that literally the stuff that makes the, the difference between life and death, win and lose, win and loss, win and lose in a conflict. But yeah, I don't know, it's definitely possible. Uh, two, 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 two. Will the supersonic bomber become obsolete in the future? Why Russia, Russia keeps building more to 160M, while China and US don't have any plan to build such bomber? Uh, could you comment on Russia Air Force electronic warfare capability? How does PLAF do compare to Yusuf? Okay. How do, does it compare? Well, I've made a, an entire long video about the PLAF, which is probably introductory, but it's a good place to start. Uh, about the Russian Air Force electronic warfare capability, we just commented, yes, the elec Russian electronic warfare is it's always been, to be honest, even during the Cold War, but even more today, is expected to be really, really capable. Um, now, but more interesting is this thing about the supersonic bomber. So, obviously, when you build a bomber, you, there, there, there's a mission, you have a mission in mind, you have a specific set of missions and uh, that you believe you will need to accomplish, and uh, you are building accordingly. Uh, the Americans and the Chinese, uh, and the Chinese have chosen stealth designs, but also the Russians, I don't know the state of their uh, Pak da I think it's called uh, um, a program for a stealth bomber, but uh, they are working on the, they're, they're all working on that, and, but, and the role of stealth bomber is penetration in high, highly cont contested airspace just to strike uh, extremely important targets. That's what it is. So you can uh, think of um, a stealth bomber as a sort of the dagger in a cloak and dagger fight. It will, uh, in a, let's say, it is the secret weapon that appears in suddenly without being expected and hits you uh, by surprise and then runs away hiding again uh, a bomb uh, the 216 is something different um, it is more you can consider more the uh, of a hammer than a, uh, more of a hammer actually rather than the rather than a dagger. Uh, because um, its main role today it is to um, uh, transport cruise missiles. Uh, the Russians, another area, techno seems that I'm actually pro-Russian. Now, now I will be accused of being pro-Russians. But another area oh, where the Russians have invested a lot and they're definitely on par with the United States. And in terms of ranges, they're probably superior now uh, they is the is the cruise weapons cruise missile uh, is the cruise weapons either subsonic or supersonic and uh, the uh, 2160 is becoming expected to be principally mostly a platform to launch the caliber class weapons so it's uh, um, why do you need a supersonic bomber to do that? No, because those weapons can greatly benefit from being launched at high speed, for the same reason as the air-to-air -air weapons do, but also because uh, when you are in, 
a useful tactic is could be actually closing to the target at high speed launching and escaping at high speed increasing the survivability survivability of the platform uh, that's the um, that's the idea. That's the same reason. That's exactly the same concept that they used for the naval aviation during the Cold War. The same reason why the two twenty two, the tuple of twenty two is supersonic and could separate and launch the missiles at supersonic speed. Uh, they they were launching the missiles probably within the range of some defenses. Um, the and in that case, getting in quickly and out quickly was definitely beneficial. So that's the reason why it's um, the the Russians are choosing the two one hundred and sixty. Uh, the Americans uh, don't have anything. Uh, don't don't think they think they need anything comparable. Just uh, just simple as that. Uh, Rick is saying, Hi Seven, I was wondering if it could be effective a long-range radar guided missile that once approached the target releases another missile but infrared guided. This would combine the right range of radar guidance and the high accuracy and uh, passivity of infrared system. Do you think it would be a system that would be advantageous in terms of effectiveness complexity? Uh, so, it doesn't exist as such, but the concept is absolutely well known. French, uh, Russian, again Russia, sorry guys, uh, Russian and French uh, weapons normally have a rather guided version and, uh, oops, normally uh, <laughs> have a, a rather guided version and a infrared guided version. And what they plan is to launch. Uh, what they plan to do is uh, to launch them in to launch them to use them both, in the sense again against uh, you may launch two weapons against a target rather than one to maximize the possibility of hitting them and uh, to hitting the target. Uh, one with the radar guidance, the other one with the infrared guidance, and potentially a third one with the passive uh, guidance to homing on the jams or the radar of the target. This is a relatively common practice, practice for the Russian aircraft, and the same is true for the French aircraft. So, yes, the idea is definitely valid. Combining the two into a single platform, I don't think it's ever been done, to be honest, and it probably will be impractical overall, but yes, it's definitely the, the right concept. Apprentice asking, can China ever become world-class at manufacturing turbofan engines? Yes, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. With all the effort that they're pouring into this, there's no chance that at some point they will catch up. The point is exactly when. They are so recently the Russians accepted to sell the uh, Su 35s uh, to China, even though they were concerned that they, they were going to reverse engineer the engines. No? And apparently, there's some unofficial declaration that they said that, well, in that anyway, the Rush, the Chinese were going to be there in five years anyway. So there was no point in withholding the technology. It was better doing some cash right now, selling the, selling the, selling the aircraft, and yes, just looking the other way while the Chinese were reverse engineering the engines. Um, so basically, is a matter of is a matter of when, not if. And this is one of my favorite question questions. This is so Sam is asking one of the most glorious questions I've ever heard. 
Finally, finally, for God's sake, what in the world are those two doors that open behind the opening of the lift on the F-35B? Question mark, 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 question mark. They seem so related by, like what, more air? Why you go to the DSI intakes and the lift fan? Why more? It's just more complex equipment. I didn't wait to the already overweight aircraft. By the way, what is the range of the flying failure anyway? And so on and so on and so on and so on. So this glorious question has a rather underwhelming answer. <laughs> They're just an auxiliary air intake. <laughs> Nothing more. And uh, the, um, the specific engineering reason why they split the intake in two, I don't know. Uh, but that's, that's not unheard of. It's not uncommon. Um, for example, the Tejas have auxiliary air intakes on the side of the aircraft. Um, it's not unheard of to have to split the intakes for, for different flight conditions. So that's the case. So I'm sorry, but I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it the way you formulated the questions. Zoom Brissad is asking, uh, wow, just, just one hour has gone by. On the subgrip and E, there is a now a protrusion with a little bulb in front of the canard through. The bulb is, as I understand, an IR sensor to detect incoming missiles through. However, this protrusion also seems to cover the gap between the fuselage and the canard, at least when looking from the front. Is this protrusion there to mitigate radar refractions from this gap? I flipping have no idea. Um, and then after watching some pictures of the aircraft, I thought, yes, maybe it's reducing a little bit of the reflection. It seems that as if the canard can move a few degrees up and down without being exposed from the front. Yeah, but just the root of the canard. Huh? Maybe this is a very small effect, but it doesn't make, it's not making the aircraft stealth as you, there's no stealth mode as you're asking here. But I don't think, it, don't, I don't think it really makes sense. Then, Zon Brizado always asking, one weakness with the current grip and CD is the performance in energy battle. The Gripen E receives a new more powerful engine. How much will this new engine mitigate this shortcoming? Would Gripen benefit from even more powerful engines available in the future? Uh, well, every little helps, every little bit helps. Uh, e is still slightly underpowered if compared with uh, aircraft in the same class. So not as much as before, but uh, it's still slightly underpowered. As far as I know, there are no plans to install any new engine in the future. So, but I don't know, it depends on what the market asks. Saab is really following what the market is asking. So if some customer will want more power, maybe and is capable of paying, I'm sure they will do. Uh, then, according to specification, Gripen E is one meter longer and 20 centimeter wider than the C version. But where has it grown? And when you asked this, you made me think exactly because I had no idea. Then I tried to find some high definition pictures. And I think, but I don't know for sure, but I think that the nozzle is slightly longer. The nozzle with the with the new engine is slightly longer, probably 10, 15 centimeters more. And then it seems to me that the air intake and the cockpit and the entire uh, frontal front section of the aircraft has been moved a bit forward okay 
So it doesn't seem to be a meter, an entire meter, to be honest. But that's an area that I think it is where it has been stretched. So since it's not clear where it has been stretched, probably the truth is it has been stretched a little bit everywhere. And it is just not apparent to the eye. In fact, I notice if you see that if you watch the two aircraft, they really you really don't notice uh, if if they that that, that they are really the, the, the difference. So I think it is stretch a little bit of everything. Every is a little bit of everything. Teja, how do Egy Egyptian and Indonesian Air Force use Su thirty five Su thirty thirties with F sixteens? How do they achieve operational compatibility? Are direct energy weapons really practically possible on jets? So these are two completely different questions. The first one probably is the most interesting. And uh, uh, these uh, air forces that actually mix Russian and Western aircraft normally have their own standards. The essential ones are the communications and the data links. So they choose one and have the aircraft modified to use the two of them. Since a Russian aircraft normally, I mean, I mean the, the most recent ones, the one after the Cold War, built up, built a design after the Cold War, are actually usually designed to have some level of compatibility with Western equipment. Uh, they normally install, for example, a Link 16 or they install the Western uh, designed radios on the aircraft rather than vice versa. And that's the way they do. Then they keep having, uh, then they have a separate, uh, obviously they have two separate logistics for both of them. And uh, so those who know uh, who, those who, who mm, I mean those who are not really familiar with the um, those who are uh, who are not really familiar with the with this problem will tell you that it is a waste of money because you don't achieve standardizations and uh, those who think to the combat effectiveness will tell you that it is a great idea to have two completely separate apologies sources of uh, 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 sources of logistics to separate entirely separate logistics sources and two really incompatible aircraft doing the same mission because this adds a lot of resilience through variety i have dedicated a speaking of the indian air force i've actually dedicated an entire video about that it has a terrible audio but it's one of the videos that I'm more um, that I think is more is one of the more interesting. So that's the reason why. Super Turtle is telling me any thoughts of inform or information on the F-35B that just went down. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, an accident that happened uh, yesterday, I think, in the Mediterranean when a, a British F-35B from the Queen Elizabeth actually crashed in the sea. The pilot ejected and was recovered, so no uh, human losses, luckily. And um, while everybody now is freaking out that the, the wreckage could be recovered by a, a Russian submarine and uh, um, could be recovered by a Russian submarine and uh, the the some secret the some secrets could be leaked. That's one of the that's one of the great that's one of the reasons why. Yeah, this is a long story and I won't go into the details. Uh, unfortunately, no, I don't have any additional information. I mean, the the Royal Navy has been very uptight about this. They're saying there's just um, there's just an um, an investigation about about the accident, the accident, and we'll see what is going to happen in uh, in the future, and um, and we'll see what what it is. I believe it's probably um, 
yeah, probably in, probably an accident, something similar to what happened in Japan. I mean, it, it happens. Unfortunately, it happens. Military aircraft, it happens. Uh, Nevi Dimka, um, for last questions from Nevi Dimka. Uh, well, no, second to last question from Nevi Dimka is uh, asking um, why uh, is is showing basically it's a very it's a very long question. It's actually showing a, a picture of uh, one of the latest productions, Su fifty seven. Uh, which shows a nice shiny and polished surface and is asking um, maybe is not the stealth is better than expected yes I don't know how to tell this this is something that comes up times and times again if you look in the comments under the um, videos of Su 57s there are endless comments that say two things two, two, two things the Russians that a the Russians have only one, and b that is not stealth because there are the rivets exposed. Question. So, point one. No, the Russians. Are, it is in production. It's not a large scale production, but it is in production, and they do. The Russians don't do a press release every time they deliver one. So we may say it's true. The first one uh, had an accident and was destroyed. Uh, but the, the, they kept producing the aircraft, so I suppose that by now they will have produced a few. B, the aircraft with the uh, rivets, I suppose, with all the seams that were not completely, uh, completely sealed and so on, were prototypes. Many of those prototypes were not designed for testing stealth. And there's maybe just one or two pro of the final prototypes were brought to a standard that was similar to the production aircraft. Production aircraft has a finish that is much better than the prototypes. Hence, it is decently stealth. As I said, there are analyses that say that it's probably still not as stealthy as the F-35 or the F-22, but it's still decently stealth. So yes, it is probably more than many more stealth than many think. Uh, and that's basically the, the question is very long. Now the last question is the most important questions of all that I had in this uh, in this uh, for this for this live stream, which was again asked from Acceptor. That is asking, can you cook spaghetti bolognese, bolognese at 33,000 feet? And now we are going to answer the question. What you're seeing, because it is a fundamental question that I'm sure everybody, uh, and I'm sure everybody is going to be interested. So what you see is the phase diagram of water. Basically, you have temperature on the x-axis axis, and pressure on the y-axis. And uh, depending on temperature and pressure, water can be liquid, vapor, or solid, like ice. So, for, uh, if you look at the red line, no? if temperature is below at uh, atmospheric pressure, pressure uh, the um, uh, water below zero becomes ice. From zero to 100 stays a liquid. Above 100 degrees becomes uh, boils out and becomes vapor, no? and it turns into into vapor by boiling. So, what are the con so uh, to cook uh, pasta? At you need to boil the, and particularly to cook bolognese pasta, you need to make ragu, 
you need to make ragu and you need to, to boil the pasta and mix the two. Well, let's suppose that you made ragu normally. So you already have it available, you just went to the supermarket and bought it. I'll bait the kind of ragu that you find outside uh, of Bologna is normally just something which is sort of ragu like it's not original ragu for example ra the original ragu doesn't have uh, tomatoes so it's not red okay but anyway in um, Let's suppose you already have ragu, so you have to boil the water and mix the two. So let's suppose that you go on an aircraft that, uh, with a sort of a pressure vessel where you have the water that you need. You also bring, um, I don't know, a, or an electric hob or anything like that. Uh, you put the water in there, you close the pressure vessel, then you get them, you go on the plane, the plane takes off, takes off, gets 33,000 feet, and then uh, I don't know, opens the door and depressurizes the the cabin to the atmospheric to the local atmospheric conditions to the local atmospheric pressure. Uh, this state now obviously you need oxygen to survive at that level and uh, very warm clothes. <laughs> but apart from that, let's suppose that you have both and you can you can still operate quietly. Now at I checked with the standard atmosphere, with the standard model of the uh, Hertz atmosphere, at 33,000 feet, which is roughly 10,000 meters um, altitude, the pressure is uh, 26 kilopascal. That is about one third of the pressure at sea level. And here you see the green line that represents this point. Now you can see that the water at this pressure boils to a significantly lower uh, temperature, it should be around 60, 65 degrees, something like this. Now, when you put the pasta into the boiling water, where you normally leave it between 8 and 12, 13 minutes, depending on the type of pasta you are using. When you put the pasta in there, the, there are some chemical reactions within, well, it is soaked with water, but there are also some chemical reactions that happen within the pasta that normally is a very mm, stiff and brittle thing, but it becomes the, the pasta that you eat, that you like. Those chemical reactions at 65 degrees are very, very, very slow. And some of them even don't happen. So at that temperature, you will need to buy to boil the pasta probably for hours, and the final result is probably going to be really underwhelming. So if the ragu was good, you will end up wasting it. So the answer is yes, you can, it's definitely not worth it. And I consider this probably my most important piece of scientific education that I ever provided on the channel. Okay, so we are done. We have been at this for one hour and 20 minutes, more than that. Uh, so uh, let's. If someone wants to ask, uh, um, I want to ask the. So if someone wants to ask some questions in the chat, feel free for another ten minutes, fifteen minutes. I'm happy to answer. So okay, now I'm hungry. Sorry, guys. <laughs> if I made you angry, hungry. Um, American says ketchup. No, the ketchup is totally different. Ketchup is just tomato sauce with spices and so on, which is quite good. I quite like it, but it's something totally different. Penne or conchiglie, uh, which has the lower air <laughs> Um... 
<laughs> okay, yeah, uh, okay. If, if here there is anyone from the Discord server, there is a guy who actually did some interesting, well, simplified analysis of RC, uh, of RCS, RC, RC, rather cross sections of aircraft. Uh, I invite him to do uh, some rather uh, the study of some radar cross sections or the main types of pasta. I would suggest rigatoni, uh, well, spaghetti, obviously, which is the main type of pasta, conchiglie, penne, rigatoni, and tortiglioni. These five will be great. I think Brazilian want to ask something. If I can answer, happy to answer. French people says Bolognese for ragu. I didn't know. Ravioli. Okay. Okay. This uh, this went a bit out of control. But maybe we can get back to aircraft. Is it true that Otis is the result of a brief liaison between a vacuum cleaner and a supercomputer? I'm not disclosing anything. There will be uh there will be uh there will be a, a myth of the origins video at some point. With a degree in engineer, can you become a military analyst? Um I so I depends where you are and which country. Uh, okay, from your name you sound Italian. So um, if you get if you study engineering and then you try to do a final dissertation with a military company, uh, yes, yeah, probably is a good background. Uh, is a good background to to start working. It's a bit difficult to enter in, say, in a think tank, for example, or something like this. But okay, but no, it's probably probably it's probably not impossible. I. I'm a Brit, but I have a killer lasagna and salmon carbonara recipes. Pretty good grandma's apple cake, too. No, Valerio, it's quite... I mean, there's not that many think tanks in, in Italy, but for example, there are a few. There are also some newspapers. It's difficult to live in... I think it's very difficult to live out of that. Huh? But I don't know. You could try. You could try, I think. Uh, Uncle Heavy, what do you make of the Tic Tac videos? Uh, okay, that one was almost a joke, basically, uh, in the sense that nobody actually... I haven't seen anyone discussing the fact that they were humans. So I... I that there are a few now, but at the time I didn't know that they were there, so... I made a video which is basically was basically just fun. I, I don't think it's really interesting to be honest. Until we know more, in the sense, so much in the area, uh, in this, in terms of UFOs and uh, unknown area phenomena, turned out to be uh, just a, a hot air balloon. So I don't think it is really worth. Uh, I don't think it is really worth dedicating too much time. Also, you seem to not have been really interested. So there was this was one of the least popular videos ever. Uh, so I'm probably not going to talk about that. Thank you for all your awesome videos. You're welcome. Okay, I see a lot of cooking, a lot of food. Okay, happy to get back to aircraft if you guys. <laughs> I actually created, I actually created probably a, a monster. Uh, <laughs> speaking about cooking. Thoughts of Australia's Australia's loyal wingman flying from a stovel type carrier recovery by barrier. Obviously, it's doable, definitely doable. It has been done already. 
um, has been done already if the aircraft uh, is capable of actually taking off uh, with a decent uh, with a decent uh, uh, payload or or fuel from the from a, from an aircraft uh, yes why not Uh, yes, I've seen some of the deb I've seen the debunking, definitely. The debunking, well, I have to say that part of the debunking is really convincing. Part is really not, I think. But still, uh, I'm bending, okay. Okay, to be really UFOs, to be really not of this world, you need definitely more proof definitely more like this is it is strange but it is uh, but we don't know I don't know how much strange what do elephants eat on long flights um, good question should you should be asking the an elephant Probably you need a galaxy of an Anton of uh, Miria to to transport them, and oh God! Now this this is this is this is an involuntary joke. So Ilya Kuryakin is asked, "What do elephants eat on long flights?" And Uncle. Heavy is uh, replying, whatever they've packed in their trunks. That's an involuntary joke. <laughs> That's a great involuntary joke. So at night we actually created another joke. We've seen a, a joke actually starting. Have you ever seen, did you ever know anyone who actually claimed to have invented a joke? I've never. Any reports from conception of aircraft designs that uses variable geometry as a stealth purpose, i.e. an aircraft that can use this feature to penetrate in high threat enemy airspace? No, never heard of. Uh, never, never heard of uh, anyone. You say something... Uh, you... No, don't be sorry of being silly. That's incredibly funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy. Uh, uh, no, so I don't think that any... I've never seen any concept of stealth aircraft that changes the shape to become more stealthy when it's needed and then goes back to different shape to, be, to have better flying conditions. No, I've never seen that. Like Sokka, I've invented plenty of jokes, but they're all terrible. Okay. There was a friend of mine that used to say, I have a lot of good ideas that I don't agree with. But anyway. You have no idea how many years I have wait waited to use that line, okay, uh, Uncle Heavy. You have no idea how many years I've waited to use that line, so well, I'm, I'm glad you finally have the opportunity. Okay, sorry. Okay, so pretty much nobody's speaking about aircraft or military, let's say, or military stuff right now, but I'm happy. I, I, I'm so fascinated by the, by the chat now. Right time, so uh, I, I, I don't want to stop this because I see what, where you guys are going. Anyway, uh, Fabio is still, still talking about stealth aircraft with the variable geometry. He says, like a new revised F-111, for example. And Carl Davis is actually replying, needless complexity. So I sort of agree, uh, I think. In... Uh, so, sort of agree is probably a complexity that today is not uh, is not really is not really necessary. Mm. 
Okay. Okay, what's the question? Ilya, what's the question? Doesn't always really boil down to a, to a combat from Um, I, what you mean exactly? So you're saying that anyway, the most important element is uh, is uh, is uh, the most important. Any aircraft should actually be cap Any sorry, any air force should actually plan to acquire air superiority by air to air combat. Yeah, possibly. Possibly, but this is, uh, uh, I mean, depends in the sense that, I mean, I would rather say that a, an Air Force should be balanced, should choose the kind of missions that are most important. Well, if you're not the United States, China, Russia, choose the missions that are most important for you and work on those air combat Will be there will always be need of air combat there, but there will always need to attack missions. There will always need to close their support. There will always be the need of this kind of things, and choosing the way you do them is probably one of the most. It's probably the, the strategic choice that every air force should do. Yes, I'm doing well, thank you. I'm just traveling, as I said, I'm not in the usual place. I always wonder why the Yak-41 has the engine recess closer to the center of the plane. Does it have to do with the ba with balance or something? Um, uh, yeah, no, definitely the positioning is the influenced by what is by the balancing of the aircraft. So it's quite likely that's the reason why the position is there. How many stealth fighters aircraft you need to have superiority on the battlefield? That doesn't that not a matter of how many. If the opponent has zero, uh, if, if the opponent has zero aircraft and you have one SOP with camel, then probably you have a superiority already. China and Russia are in full-on strategic defense and tech alliance, better than an alliance defending each other. Well, at this stage, they are pretty close, and they and they, and they are also politically doing some other elements, which I wouldn't like to enter, honestly, the, to sort of become independent and less sensitive to the actions that the United States may want to do. Uh, but strategically speaking, in the long term, they are probably they they have a conflict area which is Siberia in the east of the of the, the what is today the east part, the entire east part of Russia, and they have another conflict potential conflict area in what used to be the Central uh, Asian uh, ex-Soviet republics, uh, which could be the two areas where they could uh, there could be some contrast in terms of influence. So they um, today they more they, they have more common enemy than they just goodwill. Will it be a good idea for certain countries to have plans to turn container ships into a poor man's carrier in case of major conflict? Um, okay, in case of major conflict, you really need everything. So, so having some plans on that is definitely a good idea. Making that really work is much more complicated. 
8 and Thunderbolt 2. Should it stay or should it go? Definitely should it stay. They should build another one. A modern, a modernized one with all the modern uh, with all the modern uh, technologies that the A10 doesn't have. But you need uh, but to support the the troops, you need uh you need definitely something that can like the A10 that can flow that can fly for a long time that can loiter that can fly slow that can mostly that can take damage and still bring back uh the pilot and uh, and the most of the airframe uh so yes should stay Uh, upgrade the war talk definitely. Um, I would say uh, I don't know if it can st still be there. Upgraded the cells actually the the, the the structure structurally they are quite old. They changed the wings, but it has been very expensive. Probably probably building a modern one would be a good idea. Okay, some discussion again on the aircraft carriers. Okay, what time is it? Four. Okay, uh, I suppose I need, uh, I definitely need to drink something because <laughs> I'm definitely out of, uh, I'm definitely out of voice. Uh, and here is definitely quite late, it's 20 minutes to midnight. Uh, so since I'm traveling, I'm hoping to publish a video for next Sunday, but if you don't see one, please don't get upset. Um, programming will start again def in, in two weeks. Uh, the regular programming will start again in two weeks. But, uh, okay, so a few more things. What is going on with Armata Thank production? I think, uh, not, I'm definitely not an expert. You uh, should ask her a defect on that. Uh, they, they, it is, they are in production. They are in production, I think. Again, like the Su-57, the very slow rate, but they are in production. Okay, guys, as this has been a really, really lovely, uh, really, really, really lovely live stream. I really enjoyed this time we, we spent together. It is something that I really love doing. I hope it has been interesting for you guys. I hope you are forgiving this sort of makeshift. Uh, this sort of makeshift uh, arrangement that I am having, um, it, uh, but I probably need to drink something and <laughs> rest a little bit. What is the two doors that open behind the lift fan of the F-35B? That's the question that I answered. <laughs> okay, that's the, answer, the, that's the question that I, uh, that I answered before. They are just an auxiliary air intake. Why they do exist, we don't know. It's the real engineering reason is I didn't find anything, but they are, they are definitely an auxiliary intake. Anyway, guys, so thank you very, very, very much for watching. As I said, I really loved this live stream. And yeah, see you next time and stay tuned.